There are no dangerous thoughts. Thinking itself is dangerous. I'm Paul Kennedy. Welcome to Ideas. Fifty years ago, the political philosopher Hannah Arendt published her best-known work, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. Based on her reporting for the New Yorker magazine about the trial of Adolf Eichmann in 1961, the book made her both famous and infamous. Eichmann had been one of the principal architects of the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews, in which six million people died. Captured in Argentina after the war and brought to Israel, the spectacle of Eichmann on trial riveted the world. Arendt set herself the task of trying to understand what it was that Eichmann had done to place the ghastly events of the Holocaust, the man himself, and what he had to say in some kind of comprehensible moral framework. As a philosopher, she wanted to know how we might come to understand the inexplicable. The sad truth is that most evil is done by people who never make up their minds to be good or evil. Today on Ideas, The Human Factor. A look back at Hannah Arendt, her ideas, her famous book, and why she was so controversial. Joining me for a discussion are four people who thought a lot about Hannah Arendt. Roger Berkowitz is a professor at Bard College and director of the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and the Humanities. Hannah Arendt was, above all, a thinker of freedom. Um, she lived at a time, obviously, in which debates about totalitarianism, individual liberties, civil liberties were, were paramount. But she was someone who, above all, cared about and thought that freedom was in danger in the world. And her attempts, her lifelong attempt, was to uh, think deeply about what that meant and how we might preserve it. Rivka Galchin is a novelist and essayist whose book, Atmospheric Disturbances, was nominated for the Governor General's Award. She writes for The New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, and The New York Times. I don't know if I could really say um, what would be her strongest contribution, but I guess what I, on a personal level, find most compelling about her is also maybe what has caused her problems, which she seemed um, in a kind of wonderful way, almost unable to anticipate what would be extremely upsetting to people. And, and she had a sort of unembarrassed form of thinking where if she thought it and it seemed rigorous and she stood behind it, she went ahead and said it. I guess that's what seems most compelling to me about her. Adam Kirsch is a poet, senior editor at the New Republic, and a columnist for The Tablet. Well, in addition to what's been mentioned already, I would want to add her role as a sort of representative and maybe last guardian of a German and specifically German Jewish intellectual tradition, which was more or less liquidated in her lifetime and how she preserved its values and some of its concepts, um, bringing them to a new audience. And Adam Gopnik, longtime staff writer at The New Yorker and former Massey lecturer. I think two things strike me, Paul. One is, is that she was a member of a sort of great generation that was able to articulate clearly in different ways an idea that there was a, a totalitarian evil that was independent of left or right. That is to say, where you didn't have to be apologizing for some form of left totalitarianism because you were broadly sympathetic with leftist ideas or for rightist totalitarianism because you were broadly sympathetic with, uh, with conservative or reactionary ideas. She was one of a remarkable generation of people who said, no, there's a phenomenon here that is evil and that has roots both in the left and the right. That seems self-evident to us now, but it didn't seem self-evident at the time. I think that's terribly important. The other thing I think, and obviously I'm self-interested in saying this, is that she did a terrific job of genuinely articulating very complicated philosophical ideas to a broad audience. She was not a popularizer in any sense, not somebody who took other people's ideas and made them available to a million readers in The New Yorker. She had her own ideas, which were resolute and difficult, as Rivka says, and she articulated those to a million readers. That's an astonishing accomplishment. Hannah Arendt indeed had her own difficult ideas, and perhaps it's the context of those ideas that best helps us to understand what it was she was aiming for in political philosophy. Born in 1906 into a family of German Jews, Arendt studied philosophy at Marburg University with Martin Heidegger, who was also her lover, and then she later studied with Karl Jaspers in Heidelberg. 
1933, she fled Germany and went to Paris, and in 1941, she moved to the United States and took up a series of teaching positions at various universities. Her philosophical background, Heidegger and Jaspers, was perhaps too theoretical for her tastes. Arendt wanted something different, something more descriptive of the 20th century world. Her own writings span a wide range of subjects. Totalitarianism, the nature of political action, what it means to think, the importance of stories, what, in short, is meant by being human. The 20th century was a disaster, in her opinion. What was needed was a complete rethink of the meaning and role of philosophy, a complete rethink of the idea and responsibility of being human. Here's Roger Berkowitz to start us off. She was born in 1906. She died in, in 1975. She lived through the rise of imperialism, World War I, World War II, came to the United States, lived through the 60s and the Civil Rights Movement. And she wrote about all of these things, her independence of thought uh, and her refusal to be on the left or the right, as Adam was just saying, is, is absolutely important. She had a particular view of the 20th century as the first century in which the traditional, customary, religious bonds that held people together in nations, in religions, in communities had fallen apart. And she described it as a century of homelessness, rootlessness, and loneliness. And her lifelong effort is to understand the impulse towards totalitarianism that she thinks emerges from this breakdown of the cultural, social, religious, traditional, and customary bonds uh, that had for millennia held people together within certain limits. And that's the world that she came out of, and her whole work can be understood as a response to that. A century of homelessness, rootlessness, and loneliness, she called it a century where our political structures had drifted towards totalitarianism. Why that should have happened was of enormous interest to her, and central to that question is the responsibility of philosophers, and of thinkers in general, in playing a role in society. Here's Adam Gopnik. The criticism, I think, that's um, often made, or made nowadays, of, of her work, and particularly of uh, Ekman in Jerusalem, but also of uh, her book on totalitarianism, is that she fails to hold the German philosophical tradition sufficiently responsible for the evil acts that she anatomizes so well. And that as a consequence that her view of it, that is to say, if you look at, I was just rereading it for this conversation, if you look at her totalitarianism book, she blames mass society. That's basically the villain in her, in her view, it seems to me. And you know, much to be said about that. But you put it alongside. I, I said a moment ago, Paul, that I thought that uh, uh, one of the things that makes her striking is that she was, though independent, she was not isolated. She was one of a generation of people who had a fundamental insight that you could not blame the other guys' totalitarianism while protecting your own, left or right. And it seems to me that if you compare her, say, to uh, Karl Popper and to Karl Popper's uh, Open Society and its Enemies, an almost exactly contemporary study of very similar kinds of things, Popper uh, aggressively, unashamedly, blames philosophers for the catastrophes of the 20th century. And he particularly blames the German idealist philosophers for what went wrong. Arendt, it seems to me, doesn't chooses not to do that. It's not that, she, it's not that she's covering anything up. She chooses not to do that. She chooses to place her, uh, her critique, if you like, her, her uh, attack, much more on the nature of mass society, technology, industrialization, and those phenomena. And the philosophers, one might say, get off a little easy. Her entire response to Heidegger and the time she lived in was to say, we live in a time in which we cannot go back. We cannot go back to a home. We cannot go back to a religion or customs or communities. We have to live in a world, which she called it, without banisters. And this, this is the nicest one of those images that those of us who read her like very much of hers. To live in a world without banisters means to live completely adrift, without being able to hold on to any truths. And that's a very difficult thing. I think one of the things one can criticize for Hannah Arendt for is she demanded of all of people and of all friends to be able to live without banisters, which is a very difficult thing. And she was critical of people, people like Heidegger, people like Eichmann, who needed banisters and in searching for banisters 
we're led into a kind of gangster philosophy, just as you said. Well, I think maybe some of the ambiguity is that she had a highly intellectual understanding of what constitutes goodness. Um, for her, goodness was a matter of thinking, primarily, not feeling. And what other people might describe as compassion, she described in intellectual terms as the ability to think from another person's point of view, which means that there's a, a tendency in her work to imply that only people who are outstandingly good at thinking are immune to temptations, say, of totalitarianism. And that is uh, almost an anti-democratic message because it suggests that without highly developed reasoning skills, you have no um, immunity to the sort of mass-mindedness that she finds in Eichmann. However, it's true that she does not at all identify that kind of intellectual ability with just being educated. And on, in fact, on the contrary, one of the things that she points out about Eichmann is that he internalized Kant's ideas in a completely backwards way so that he was able to commit atrocities as though he were doing it for idealistic reasons, um, precisely because he didn't genuinely think, but he was able to manipulate intellectual formulas. Philosopher Susan Neiman is the author of Evil in Modern Thought, an Alternative History of Philosophy. Here's an excerpt from an interview with Susan Neiman talking about Hannah Arendt. If evil were truly incomprehensible, if evil were truly unintelligible, you would have a black hole at the heart of the world, it seems to me. Um, you would have a sense that um, there's something crucial, not some little thing that we can't understand, but one of the things that affects humankind the most that can't be explained. That's a, you know, a fatal flaw in the universe, a fatal flaw in creation, and a fatal flaw in us, right? Um, that is the sense that it's all mysterious, it could break out at any time, you know, you're looking at somebody who looks ordinary and in fact he's a monster and, and um, the world as a whole is a terrifying place that it's very, very hard to say yes to. And so that's the threat of the Holocaust, I think. Um, and what Arendt did in that book was to say, look, evil's comprehensible. And if evil is something that we can understand, then actually we're not fundamentally flawed beings. We may be weak, but uh, we're not living in original sin. We don't need a miracle to save us. We could just possibly save ourselves if we worked at it hard enough. And that means that the, uh, the world is, as she says in a, the most beautiful passage in that book, the world is a place fit for human habitation. There are no dangerous thoughts. Thinking itself is dangerous, Hannah Arendt once wrote. Thinking is primordial poetry is also from her. One of her major ambitions was to give thinking, the act of thinking, a role in the world. She believed that as long as thought is conceived as being something separate from the other qualities of human existence, it wouldn't be possible for us to truly understand how society actually works. It was the task of art to unite thinking and social reality. Poetry, whose material is language, is perhaps the most human and least worldly of the arts, the one in which the end product remains closest to the thought that inspired it. Of all things of thought, poetry is the closest to thought. She asked the question of whether thinking is what might be able to protect us from evil and totalitarianism. She never said she thought it was. And for her, thinking was not an elite activity. Everyone can think insofar as we're human. That doesn't mean everyone will. And it's not about education. It's about independence. It's about courage. The first political virtue is courage, Hannah Arendt says. It's about being willing to stand apart from the crowd, whatever the crowd is, and think for oneself. And who does that? It's it's not clear who's going to do that and how we train people to do that. That's one of the that's the sixty four thousand dollar question for Hannah Arendt. For her, what thinking meant was to train the mind to go wandering, to train the mind to go and think from the perspective of other people. Right? I mean, to you know, with Eichmann you can see it. 
he would go and talk to the Jews in Israel and he thought, why don't they understand me? I, you know, I, I, I was under a lot of pressure, you know, be my friend. And she's like, he just couldn't think from someone else's point of view. And we see that all too often today with political partisanship, with religious partisanship, with international partisanship, people are caught up in seeing the world from their perspective and they can't think from the perspective of others. That's what Arendt meant by thinking. Let me just say that I think that the the issue, just to come back to something you were saying a moment ago, Roger, often is, are we living in a world without banisters? In other words, in a world without bumpers, a world to use her metaphor, or are we living in an improved world? In other words, is the world of the open society actually one in which we recognize that the banisters were always crutches, that we never really needed them, that it was an illusion or a fiction that we needed those, that we needed them. It seems to me, as a reader of hers, that she's always at most ambiguous, ambivalent about that, about that relation, that there's a she part of her- She always ends saying, it's better this yes. way, but it's harder. Yes, she says it's better, but it's harder, but there's, yes. a, there's a, certainly a sense of loss, certainly a sense of loss in her work. And gain, I just, just to- Right, and, yes. but that is different from interestingly different from, but still very different from the Anglo-American liberal tradition, which says straight out, this is better. The world of autonomous individuals making their own way in a world without the banisters and the bumpers of community, folk, commonality is good. And for good or ill, she brought from her background a very different intuitive, emotional sense of where the pluses and minuses fell, I think, in that, in that formula, in that equation. Well, her idea of politics was so um, much a matter of individual excellence, individual speaking out, um, self-representation in a public sphere, that she was very ambivalent about the idea of belonging to a community. On the one hand, you need a community to form the frame in which you as an individual exist. You can't exist without a community. And that's one of her great insights, especially into questions of human rights. Um, she was one of the most acute people to point out the fact that the idea of human rights is null, that there's only political rights within a political community. And as soon as you, as she pointed out in relation to the Jews of Europe in the Nazi period, that as soon as you have to depend on your human rights, that you're lost because there's no one to guarantee those rights. Those rights have no substance. On, on the other hand, she was very um, suspicious of the sort of leveling and conformity of community life. Um, she, Her ideal community was the Greek polis, the idea that you would stand up in the assembly um, and give an account of yourself and your ideas and be honored as an individual within this essentially agonistic or antagonistic community. Um, she has a, a great metaphor somewhere that the heroes of the Iliad, when they came back home, formed the assembly so that they could continue to sort of fight with each other in an abstract way. And so she's very much honors and is interested in the idea of individual excellence, uh, which is always in tension with the idea of community. She saw speaking with each other, forming communities of sp talking societies, as she called them from Paris, as core understandings of what politics was and what a political community was. And so to the extent that she found that in the polis in Greece, but also in Paris communes and in the Roman Senate, it was talking with many people and people you don't agree with, actually a core aspect of it that was for her the essence of what it means to be human and to be political. But I think in that way she was quite prescient because many of the ideas that we associate with thinkers like Jürgen Habermas now, that is that democracy rests on cafe conversation as much as it rests on abstract rights is something that I think you find early and eloquently in, in all right. No cause is left but the most ancient of all, the one in fact that from the beginning of our history has determined the very existence of politics, the cause of freedom versus tyranny. Philosophers, Hannah Arendt believed, see politics as a problem to be solved. Politics, she thought, demands dialogue, conversation. It's the Greek ideal of the agora, an open space where we discuss and recognize the needs of others. Key to this, she believed, was storytelling. No philosophy can compare in intensity and richness of meaning with a properly narrated story, she wrote. And storytelling reveals meaning without committing the error of defining it. It brings about reconciliation with things as they really are. What she liked about storytelling was the ambiguity. If there's no truths, right? And if facts are contingent and debatable, 
how do we create the kind of communities, the speaking societies, the political communities that Adam was saying we need before? And her answer is we do it through stories. We tell stories. We tell narratives about the founding fathers, about the cherry tree, whatever they are. And these narratives at times will not be true, and yet they will become, in a sense, part of our world. And it's important to understand and the, the, the concept of world is absolutely central for Hannah Arendt. World is an artificial creation. And what humans have above other animals is that we can create collective artificial worlds in which we live. And those worlds are not true in any kind of logical sense. And yet, like the table around that we're sitting around that unites us and we all have these microphones and this table in front of us, so we're talking to each other and having a conversation, the world we create provides a common set of experiences, common set of stories, common facts that we come to accept. And for her, the fine line in the world is that you need common facts, you need common stories. And yet if they ever become dangerous stories or if they ever become believed in ways that are, 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 are too ideological, we need to puncture them. And that's the fine line that she's always walking in her work. Totalitarianism is never content to rule by external means, namely through the state and a machinery of violence. Thanks to its particular ideology and the role assigned to it in this apparatus of coercion, totalitarianism has discovered a means of dominating and terrorizing human beings from within. Hannah Arendt's first major book was The Origins of Totalitarianism. She thought there was something new, something modern about totalitarianism. It wasn't like anything we'd seen in the past, not like tyranny or dictatorship. Totalitarianism cut at individual will, our individual identity, our capacity to think. She writes a book called The Origins of Totalitarianism. It's 500 and some odd pages. There is no definition of totalitarianism in the book. Uh, she's not the kind of thinker in an, in an Anglo-American tradition that gives definitions. That said, there is a claim she makes, you know, at the beginning of the section on totalitarianism, that totalitarianism is a mass movement based on loneliness and homelessness that needs to establish a coherent fantasy that is totalizing under which all people will live. And, and that's really how she understands it. It is a mass movement, but it's one that's driven by ideas, intellectual ideas, often by elites and intellectuals. And it's one that would rather believe in a false lie than in the truth, which is often uncomfortable and difficult. People need to believe that their life has meaning and that there's something true. And when you deal with the messiness of facts and the messiness of life and the pain of life, you realize this quickly that often you can't explain and justify what you've done. And so you develop fantasies, you develop coherent fictions. And she says that the core of totalitarianism is that you prefer the meaning that you get from coherent fictions to the messiness and difficulty of the truth. That's why totalitarianism is not nearly a Russian or a German phenomena, but a modern phenomena for her. One thing that I always remember from that book is her emphasis on the idea of movement, of totalitarianism as a mass movement. And she, she uh, talks about the difference between a movement in the sense of a Nazi party or a communist party versus an ordinary political party. The idea that things have to be constantly kept in motion, that there's no end point. There's no point at which you say we've accomplished our goals. But on the contrary, mo motion and movement um, for its own sake are what a totalitarian system has to produce, which explains why, for example, such a system always ends up with purges because uh, the leadership has to keep moving even against itself in order to create some sense of momentum. Let, let me just add, Raj, when I referred before to a mass society, your description is the one I had in mind. That is that it has to, her analysis turns on the idea of, uh, of the mass of alienated, lonely, isolated individuals who are turned on by an idea. Is there an alternative to that? It seems to me the alternative would be to say it's not, to, while totalitarianism is a distinctly modern phenomenon. The underlying, its underlying emotional intellectual roots are, if not eternal, then go back much farther. That the temptation to turn away from the uncertainties of the life of the mind, the uncertainties of 
scientific rationalism towards some kind of organic, agreed on fictional community, that those are much older, that we can find them as far back as Plato is in Plato's Republic. We find that same kind of turn. And I think that to the degree that she makes it a modern phenomenon is one of the places where I think people have and can interrogate it. The aim of totalitarian education has never been to instill convictions, but to destroy the capacity to form any. Understanding the Holocaust is perhaps the center of Hannah Arendt's struggle to create a philosophical structure that might help us better understand ourselves. She placed the Holocaust as the central event in the horrors of the 20th century. Understand how that was possible, and a lot of other things fall into place. In her early book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, she's developing some of the ideas that would show up later, to more controversial effect, in her writing about Adolf Eichmann. When she wrote the book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, it was largely lauded by the Jewish community, and in fact was, was seen by many as, 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 you know, as, a, as, an, as an important and strong book about the uh, centrality of the ide ideology of anti-Semitism in the origin of the Holocaust. The first hundred pages of the book is called anti-Semitism. In it, she makes a distinction between anti-Semitism as, as an ideology and anti-Semitism as Jew hatred. And a lot of people sort of ignored that. And it will come back to bite her in the, in the Eichmann book uh, later on. But she saw the Holocaust as, in the end, part of a world in which movements had emerged the Nazi movement was a pan-German movement, a world-German movement. The Soviet movement was a pan-Slavic movement or an internationalist movement. They were dis divorced from states, and states were what had traditionally protected its, their citizens. And what you had now was a totalizing world movement. And the Holocaust, the final solution, was something radically new. That's something else we have to understand for her. She didn't believe it at first, like many others. When she first actually came to the facts and realized what was happening, it was just blew her mind that people would actually do this. And for her, the Holocaust is the unprecedented event that we were live, now live in a world in which we know that everything is possible. And for her, we can't go back. She is an optimist in one sense. She believes that, if you, that humans are free and they can create new things, but she doesn't believe in looking away from reality, and in her view, reality is not the Anglo-American vision of progress. She thinks the 20th century is the ugliest century in world history. You're listening to Ideas on CBC Radio 1, in North America on Sirius XM, and around the world on cbc.ca. The political philosopher Hannah Arendt asked some hard questions. Why does the human condition seem so lonely? How do love and poetry and stories work? How can we find individual freedom? What's the nature of evil? Today on the program, close to the 50th anniversary of the publication of her most famous book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a discussion about Hannah Arendt with Adam Gopnik, Adam Kirsch, Rivka Galchin, and Roger Berkowitz. The trouble with Eichmann was precisely that so many were like him, and that the many were neither perverted nor sadistic, that they were, and still are, terribly and terrifyingly normal. From the viewpoint of our legal institutions and of our moral standards of judgment, this normality was much more terrifying than all the atrocities put together. From the film Hannah Arendt, starring Barbara Sukoa, here's her speech to a class of students, explaining her opinions about Adolf Eichmann and why she wrote what she wrote in her book about Eichmann in Jerusalem. Friends in New York are sent me to report on the trial of Adolf Eichmann. I assumed that the courtroom had only one interest to fulfill the demands of justice. <laughs> this was not a simple task, because the court that tried Eichmann was confronted with a crime it could not find in the law books. And the criminal 
whose like was unknown in any court prior to the Nuremberg trials. But still, the court had to define Eichmann as a man on trial for his deeds. There was no system on trial. No history, no ism, not even anti-Semitism, but only a person. The trouble with a Nazi criminal like Eichmann was that he insisted on renouncing all personal qualities, as if there was nobody left to be either punished or forgiven. He protested time and again, contrary to the prosecution's assertions, that he had never done anything out of his own initiative, that he had no intentions whatsoever, good or bad, that he had only obeyed orders. This typical Nazi play makes it clear that the greatest evil in the world is the evil committed by nobodies. Evil committed by men without motive, without convictions, without wicked hearts or demonic wills, by human beings who refuse to be persons. And it is this phenomenon that I have called the banality of evil. In 1961, the New Yorker magazine commissioned Hannah Arendt to write about Adolf Eichmann on trial in Jerusalem for his role in the Holocaust where six million Jews had died. Arendt had been struggling with questions around the Holocaust at least since her book on totalitarianism ten years previously, and some of her conclusions in the earlier book would be clearer and more problematic in what she would now write. Totalitarianism, she had concluded, wasn't really about victims, it was about ideology. It wasn't really about the Jews. The responsibility of the victim of violence needs to be faced if the dignity of the victim, their status as public actors, is to be restored, she wrote. Well, I, I was I was thinking about what uh, Roger had pointed out about how when that, her book on, her tel, on totalitarianism came out, many it, it was received, let's say, more warmly than uh, her essay Eichmann in Jerusalem, and 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 I was I was thinking it's almost um, there's something here. I'm going to use a metaphor. I'm sure I'll regret, but I do think there's something about the Holocaust that, as you draw near talking about it, it it ha it's like a theorem and it's sort of deforming all the sound around it. There's almost some sort of fable and sort of what happened to her personally as she tried to speak about something that I think there's some sort of misapplication of like, oh, the, the only response to the Holocaust, you know, is a blank page like that. OK, we understand why a poet would say that. And there's some deep truth there. And yet at the same time, that's that's a gestural statement that has a truth that has like a boundary and is porous. And, and I think that that's a lot of what happened to her. Even, you know, I think people criticize her. They say she tried. She had the audacity to think she understood what happened. And I think there can be some confusion with the idea that there was something wrong about trying to understand and that that's not the same thing as saying, I understand it with a period at the end. Um, even even um, like Gauss, I think, had like a, a really intellectually sound way of talking about this is something that cannot be understood. And that I think that that idea gets conflated with the idea that this is something that as soon as we approach talking about it, we're sort of already morally in the wrong. It's almost like after September 11th, I think back that sort of sense of, oh, this is too large to talk about. We can't think about this because the only response is sort of silence. And, and um, it, it has like a, a problematic kind of extended perimeter. Well, I completely agree with what Rivka is saying about the necessity of talking about the untalkable. There is no unspeakable subject or untreatable subject. And that's certainly true. But I think if you get past the misunderstandings, the hurt feelings, and so on in, in people's response to Eichmann in Jerusalem. I do still think that there's a core residue of a rational critique of her view of, of uh, the Holocaust and of Eichmann. And what it tends to boil down to, it seems to me, is first that she overrates the bureaucratic, if you like, the techn technocratic, the industrialized side of the Holocaust. One of the things that has become increasingly plain, I think, is people, historians have studied it more deeply, is that the death camps, the kind of industrialized side of it, the impersonal side of the Holocaust, was actually, 
shockingly, a rather s- small side proportionally. Most of the killing actually was close-up personal murders on the, uh, on the Eastern Front. And so as a consequence that uh, by making it seem more technocratic, industrialized than it actually was, you miss some of the, the aching bloodlust moving it forward. And the other thing people often point out is, is that Eichmann, far from being a faceless bureaucrat in the, in the mall, in the industrialized factory of the, the abattoir of Jew killing, was in fact a convinced and virulent anti-Semite, that he was not uh, simply an a, a industrial man, a kind of a neutral icon who had been uh, put in, in this position, but that he was indeed an autonomous individual who had made a choice, a very strong, virulent, and passionate choice to kill Jews. And that, it seems to me, is a legitimate, putting aside all the, the, the simple, the kind of the noise and hurt, that, it strikes me, has a core of legitimate uh, relevance. I, I think you're absolutely right, but I think Hannah Arendt would 100% agree with you. Uh, I think this is one of the great disservices that many of Hannah Arendt's supporters have done to her to make this bureaucratic argument explicitly over and over again in the book. She denies Eichmann's attempt to argue that he's a bureaucrat. She denies the attempt to say that I did this because I was a tiny cog. What she's saying is Eichmann believed in what he was doing and he made a choice to do it. And because he made that, he is personally responsible. If someone is just a pure bureaucrat, they might not be. And many bureaucrats didn't make the same choice Eichmann did. And so she's trying to hold him to a risk. And she, she says there were many bureaucratic orders, including orders from Himmler to go soft on the Jews towards the end of the war that he that right. he sabotaged. And she brings that up to make the point that he wasn't just a bureaucrat. He wasn't just a cog. Now, the, it's next, the, the next question is why? Why would someone who wasn't just a bureaucrat do what he did? And one answer is he was a virulent anti-Semite. There is a lot of discussion and, 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 and there's no doubt that he was an anti-Semite. Arendt says he was an anti-Semite. The question is, what does an anti-Semite mean? And this goes back to something I said before. She makes a distinction between an anti-Semite who's an ideologue and an anti-Semite who's a Jew hater. And I don't know, and none of us really know, and she didn't know, to what extent Eichmann was one or the other. He was definitely an anti-Semite. But there are many anti-Semites who don't want to kill people, right? They want them out. They want to do other things. The question she asked herself is, what would turn Eichmann from being someone who had a moral revulsion to killing into someone who became one of the most important elements in mass murder. And she said, anti-Semitism doesn't explain that alone. And bureaucracy doesn't explain it alone. Ideology and his belief that he was serving a higher ideal and higher good, that's how she begins to understand. He was a joiner in a movement that he thought was justified. And if you read his interviews, from before the trial when he was in Argentina, what you notice over and over again is how he had enormous pride in his ability to put inside his personal conscience in order to do what he thought was important for the German Reich. It was much less about killing Jews and more about pursuing the goal of Hitler's dream of a German Reich. Right, but I think, Roger, that's certainly true, and it doesn't have a caricatural view of of Eichmann, but I think that it nonetheless, having just reread it, the, the rhetoric of mediocrity, banality, mm-hmm. is very present in her account of, of Eichmann, that he's not a, not a satanic, he's not a character out of Milton, he's not some yeah. big satanic person. He's mediocre, he's, yeah. he's banal. That's a very important part of the emotional rhetoric But that's not of, the same as of that book. The, the mediocrity the, but, the, is that he wasn't someone who wanted to go around and strangle people. He wasn't a Macbeth, he wasn't a Iago, he wasn't someone who wanted to kill people with his bare hands. He cried the one time right. that anyone has any information that he saw a Jew being killed in front of him. And he went back to his superior Mueller. This is stuff he said before the trial when he was still talking to Nazis and asked and said, this is not what I want to be involved in. We're, 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 we're creating savages out on the front. Mm-hmm. We need, we are, the point was to get them out of Germany, not to kill them. Right. And he said, okay, now Hitler's made his decision. I'll do it. I'm not trying to, to make Eichmann into a nice guy at all. He wasn't. He was, and the fact that he could so quickly turn from that feeling to thoughtlessly going on and, and carrying out the final solution shows his mediocrity, his thoughtlessness, his inability to think from another perspective, and his idealism. Whether 
you know, he's an anti-Semite. I think he is, but I don't think that's what explains it. Well, I, I guess the problem is, is that mediocrity and banality seem, and a failure of empathy, seem like inadequate words to begin to discuss one of the architects the, of the final solution. So we had to add some other words, thoughtlessness, um, stupid, dumbness, right? She, talk, she, she gives an interview to, to, to a guy named Joachim Fest, a German journalist, right. and she, t she tells a story that she says, this most explains what I meant by banality. Right. She says, Ernst Junger, a novelist in Germany, was walking after the war, and he came across some peasants in Germany, and there were some Russian prisoners of wars, totally emaciated, eating pig shit. And the peasants turn to Junger and say, look at these, these are inhuman beasts, these, these Russian prisoners of war. And Arendt says, that's what I meant by banality. It's people who think they see emaciated prisoners of war groveling for food and think of them as beasts rather than understanding their position and, under and trying to think from their point of view. That's what she thought was the base of Eichmann. And from that, he could imagine himself as a joiner, as a important member of the Nazi party doing great things and could think, you know, the Jews would do this to me if they were in power, so I'll do it to them. The greatest evil perpetrated is the evil committed by nobodies, that is, by human beings who refuse to be persons. Much of the discussion about Arendt circles back to her ideas about thinking. To be human is to think, to have agency, to take responsibility. Eichmann, she believed, was incapable of thinking about the moral context of his actions. Totalitarianism had erased that capacity from him. He had lost some part of his humanity. I, I would want to agree with Adam that a lot of the sort of rhetorical force of the book is to make Eichmann ridiculous, um, to make him uh, a figure of fun almost, and that uh, some of what the book is doing is to ridicule Nazis and Nazism um, by dismissing them from the realm of sort of basic human considerations, saying, look at Eichmann, she's constantly listing stupid things he says, malapropisms, the way he gets um, cliches and sayings wrong, uh, things, melodramatic gestures that he makes. And she, she wants it to be clear that Nazis are not sort of interesting in a way. But they're the reverse of interesting. And that's one of the themes of the book is that there's no such thing as radical evil. There's no deep root to evil. Evil is being superficial. It means uh, precisely the, uh, the absence of radicalness, of, of deep thought. And I think that that is one of the reasons why people dislike the book, because it suggests that people who are evil are laughable or that Nazism is something that can be intellectually dismissed and that therefore, and that then you've made a reckoning with it after you've intellectually dismissed it. I think that's a tendency in all of Arendt's work. It's a result of the emphasis that she places on the intellectual as a dimension of experience, that someone who fails on that dimension is not worthy of consideration, which leads to the impression, although I don't think that she herself thought this, but the impression you get in that book is that she's minimizing Eichmann, uh, minimizing the significance of who he was. And then the, the question of the book poses is, how could someone so ins insignificant do something so terrible? There's two parts of the, of the question, and, and I think two, two reasons the book was attacked, though. Uh, one was because she was soft on Eichmann, or at least some people thought she was. The other was that she was hard on the Jews, I and mean, that, that they were complicit in the Holocaust. That, that, that it, gives, it, it took away their dignity if they became only victims. They had to be victims um, who were in some place in some weird way were also guilty of, of, of what was going on. And, and can we talk about that for a moment? Well, that's sort of the flip side of, of what she says about the Nazis, is that the Jews she holds to a very high standard because she identifies with them. Um, she says, if she can imagine, if I were a leader of a Jewish council, um, could I have done something differently? Could the leaders of the Jewish councils have defended the people better? And that when she sees that kind of failure, she's personally shamed by it, I think, is the impression you get from the book. And it makes her very angry. It makes her angry in a way that she's not at Eichmann. She's not angry at Eichmann. She's dismissive of Eichmann and sort of contemptuous of him. But she's quite angry at the leaders of the Jewish councils. And she's angry at the what she sees, not just in that book, but in other books, too, as the sort of failure of political consciousness among the Jews of Europe, who didn't see what was coming, who didn't take precautions, didn't stand up for themselves. It's, it's very understandable why she would feel that way. The 
criticism to be made and that many people have made is that she wasn't accurate about what the actual possibilities for action, resistance organization were for the Jews under Nazism. The, the ironic critique is, is that it was a failure of empathy on her part, that she didn't understand fully how cornered, that she couldn't fully understand how absurdly, how insanely, how existentially limited their choices were at, at that moment. And that seems to be more borne out, at least by recent history I've read, than the view that they, that they had a, a broad range of choices. Now, you could make the case that everybody, in some ultimate sense, has a broad range of choices. You can choose not to collaborate, so to speak, at the price of your own death and the death of your family and of, of everyone you know. That's a high moral demand to make on ordinary people in, in appalling circumstances. One of Hannah Arendt's most influential books was called The Human Condition. In some respects, it's a response to what she sees as the essential loneliness of the modern world. Social life, political life as she saw it, is something that humans developed as a kind of space where we might achieve freedom. And with that freedom comes responsibility. Arendt died in 1975. What she had to say about Adolf Eichmann, about the Holocaust, is as controversial today as it was 50 years ago. But her larger explorations into how we might live together in society seem as fresh today as ever. So, time for one more run round the table, a summing up of Hannah Arendt for the 21st century. Roger Berkowitz. Well, in 21st century Western democratic countries, we have created large centralized governments with many layered bureaucracies. From Arendt's perspective, the greatest danger to freedom was large government and bureaucracy. Arendt was not a libertarian. She was not some pie in the sky, anti-government conservative, nor was she a leftist or a liberal. She was someone who thought deeply. And what she thought most about was freedom and what she came to the conclusion was that freedom could only be secured when people participated actively in their government. And the greatest danger to that, she thought, was large, centralized, bureaucratic government. And so today, what Arendt faces us with and leaves us with is a challenge to rethink and reimagine democratic self-government, Republican, Federalist self-government in a nonpartisan way with the idea of freedom as a lodestar. Adam Gopnik. I think she certainly survives as a model of a, of a writing thinker, that is somebody who could write as well as she thought and could translate her thought into articulate language. That is certainly her, her most signal importance uh, for, for me. I do think that as we go on that there's a, a liberal critique, if you like, of, of her thinking which emphasizes that what makes modern democracies work when they work is their, is their structures, the structure of protection, of, of ideas of rights, of autonomous individuals. And that her, the nature of her critique is to say that there is built into the essence, if you like, of a modern state, the virus of totalitarianism. And the liberal critique is to say, no, that virus comes from elsewhere and is cured by the immunities built into the liberal state. That's a big, significant, and ongoing argument that she plays part in. Adam Kirsch. Well, I think the relevance in the 21st century is two things. One is that we continue to live in an age of genocides um, and mass murders. So as long as that remains the case um, from Yugoslavia, uh, Rwanda, that people will have to think about these questions of why people become complicit in genocide. Uh, and that Arendt remains probably the leading theorist of that. The second thing and an aspect of her work that we haven't talked about today is that she was also a theorist of revolution and of how totalitarianism can be unseated um, through popular action. And as we're having this conversation, revolutions are going on in the Ukraine right now. That's a situation that Arendt would have been fascinated to see and to which her ideas are directly applicable. Rivka Galchin. Sort of following up on what everyone's saying, very much in that same line, I think something uh, that is distinguishing the 21st century and will continue to distinguish it is that not just governments have power, but in, in a strange way, and I know this sounds light, but I, I mean it fairly seriously, I, I feel like more than ever, you know, Kim and Kanye can sort of quickly like 
seed a thought across the globe. And, you know, even if it's not done with malevolent intention or benevolent intention, I just think there's this new, even more power than there ever was behind anything that's selling anything, whether whether it is just kind of a, a, a charismatic figure who makes a lot of money off of being charismatic or whether it's a, a specific corporation. I just think it, it's even more powerful than it ever was, which is something we all know, but I think it kind of redirects our thinking about how we're relating to power, that it's it's even more than in the past, not just or even always dominantly governments that hold it. This has obviously been a bit of a whirlwind, and uh, I, we could call it Hannah Arendt 011, I suppose. Maybe we could, we could reconvene uh, to have Hannah Arendt 211 uh, at some point in the very near future. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The persecution was aimed at the Jews. Why do you describe Eichmann's offenses as crimes against humanity? Because Jews are human. The very status the Nazis try to deny them. A crime against them is by definition a crime against humanity. I am, of course, as you know, a Jew, and I've been attacked for being a self-hating Jew who defends Nazis and scorns her own people. This is not an argument. That is a character assassination. I wrote no defense of Eichmann, but I did try to reconcile the shocking mediocrity of the man with his staggering deeds. Trying to understand is not the same as forgiveness. I see it as my responsibility to understand. It is the responsibility of anyone who dares to put pen to paper on this subject. Since Socrates and Plato usually called thinking to be engaged in that silent dialogue between me and myself. In refusing to be a person, Eichmann utterly surrendered that single most defining human quality, that of being able to think. And consequently, he was no longer capable of making moral judgments. This inability to think created the possibility for many ordinary men to commit evil deeds on a gigantic scale, the like of which one had never seen before. It is true. I have considered these questions in a philosophical way. The manifestation of the wind of thought is not knowledge, but the ability to tell right from wrong, beautiful, from ugly, and I hope that thinking gives people the strength to prevent catastrophes in these rare moments when the chips are down. Ideas, you've been listening to The Human Factor, a conversation about political philosopher Hannah Arendt. Taking part were Roger Berkowitz, Adam Kirsch, Adam Gopnik, and Rivka Galchin. Readings were by Nikola Lukšić. If you want to find out more about the show and what's coming up, or to respond to anything you heard in the show, check us out on our website, cbc.ca slash ideas. And we're also on Facebook and Twitter. The program was produced by Philip Coulter. The executive producer of Ideas is Greg Kelly. I'm Paul Kennedy.